Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's 11 o'clock, so it's the bewitching hour. It's time to get started on our series on critical race theory. Now, I know some of you are wondering about handouts, and yes, there will be handouts, but you'll get those at the conclusion of the remarks today uh, rather than at the beginning. I spent enough time in a classroom that I know that particularly when you're using PowerPoint, that oftentimes people are advancing way ahead of you rather than with you. And uh, so for those of you who are kinesthetic learners, you'd like to write as you listen. Uh, I apologize, but please feel free to use your own paper and uh, pencil and so forth. I'm going to begin this morning by saying, be careful what you wish for. About a year ago, I shared with Pastor Matt that I was looking for an easy to understand resource to trace the progression of critical race theory, or CRT. From what I understood vaguely, began with the writing of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, and perhaps before. I also knew that there were a lot of vocabulary words that I couldn't say, but that I and, and didn't, I could say, but didn't understand how or why they were used, or sometimes even what they meant. Words like critical. Why the word theory and not axiom or supposition or hypothesis? How about wokeness, intersectionality, cisgender, hegemony, transgender versus transsexual, BIPOC, environmental microaggression, and the list goes on. I soon learned what John Stone Street of the Colson Center said a friend had warned him. It's no good having the same vocabulary if we're using different dictionaries. Many of us think we know what words mean, but we need to make certain that we're using the same dictionary. So it wasn't long before Matt asked me about teaming with him to present on CRT. I said I would, and that has taken me on a journey through many books, articles, and videos, countless hours of study, and a whole lot of reflection. But tell me, should we not spend time to consider what some have said is the most serious threat to Christianity ever? A theory that as of August the 26th, 2021, has caused 27 states to introduce bills or take in other steps that would restrict teaching critical race theory or limit how teachers can discuss racism and sexism, according to an Education Week analysis. And 12 of those states have enacted these bans either through legislation or other avenues. But consider this as well. In 2019, the Southern Baptist Convention, America's largest conservative evangelical denomination, passed Resolution 9, formally commending CRT as a useful, quote, set of analytical tools that explain how race has and continues to function in society, end quote. And John MacArthur writes about James Lindsay, who's a PhD mathematician and author. He's also a self-proclaimed atheist quote, who describes himself as politically liberal, but he is also an articulate critic of countless absurdities and falsehoods that emerge out of a postmodern theory. Speaking to evangelicals in particular, he warns that CRT is a Trojan horse smuggling ideas into the movement that will undermine and eventually eliminate core biblical values and doctrines. MacArthur continues, he is absolutely right about that, end quote. So I think any reasoning person with a modest education should be able to understand these concepts, their origins, and their impacts. I pray that you would join me today in considering this theory and its origins Learn together the vocabulary, and I pray, be affirmed once again in the power, sufficiency, and the beauty of God's holy word. I take great comfort in Jesus' words to the disciples at Caesarea Philippi. 
facing all those idols, as he said, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And may we also hold fast to the climatic consummation presented in the revelation of the gathering of multi-ethnic groups around the throne of Christ. Revelation 5.9 introduces this scene by proclaiming that Christ has redeemed people from every tribe and language and people and nation. This fourfold grouping, tribe, language, people, nation, occurs seven times in Revelation. And remember that seven is the number of completion. It will become evident that I like to use PowerPoint to provide a visual image to the words that I will express. And I also prefer that you focus on what is being said and illustrated, making notes if you wish. And as I said, the PowerPoint will be available after today for those of you who don't have a, a computer or printer. Um, but it will also be included as an attachment to Wednesday's e-newsletters that you'll receive from Laurie. And uh, I would also add that I have referenced and footnoted as many resources uh, for this information as possible and the sources for them, but those will not appear on your PowerPoint because they're in the notes section. And you can also email Laurie at the church if you want to get the ones from Pastor Matt's uh, talk last week and uh, on our ongoing sessions. And they, I'm told they'll also be uh, admitted to the BBC Google Drive, where all documents related to this series are resident. So, with that as an introduction, let's dive in. Critical race theory. Three words. But I believe we need to begin with the idea of race. And as I go through this today, I want you to think biblically as I present this information, hopefully within your mind there will be scenes and scenarios and verses that will pop up as you consider what we're going to call the idea of race. So, some facts about the word. The noun race came into the English in the mid-1500s from the French, who got it from the Italian word raza, meaning species or kind. The source of raza has never been determined, but we can imagine it probably came from some Latin root words. In the phrase human race, the word essentially means species. Soon after race entered the language, one of its meanings, sometimes poetic and sometimes literal, was mankind. And it often was preceded by the adjective human. So, the human race. Now, how else was the word used? Well, Sir Philip Sidney wrote about the humane race, and Shakespeare penned the whole race of mankind. And sometimes people spoke of sexes as different races, as in the race of womankind. That was from Spencer in 1590. The word was formally used in the same way to refer to species of plants and animals, according to the Oxford English Dictionary. And in Macbeth, for example, Shakespeare called Duncan's horses Beauteous and swift, the minions of the race. Dryden wrote of the wolfish race. And Addison wrote in The Spectator, the several races of plants. Goldsmith called serpents this formidable race. And Shelley said, I wish the race of cows were perished. So you get the idea. It's a grouping of similar things. So a definition of race. Any of the major groupings of mankind having in common distinct physical features or having a similar ethnic background. But the Oxford English Dictionary adds, in recent years, the associations of race with the ideologies and theories that grew out of the work of 19th century anthropologists and physiologists has led to the word often being avoided with reference to specific ethnic groups. And although it is used in general context, contexts, it is now often replaced by such terms as P 
peoples or peoples or community. Now, this begs the question between race and ethnicity. And from what I have researched, ethnicity is a broader term than race. The term is used to categorize groups of people according to their cultural expression and identification. Commonalities such as national, tribal, religious, linguistic, or cultural origin may be used to describe someone's ethnicity. While someone may say their race is black, their ethnicity might be Italian. Or someone may say their race is white and their ethnicity is Irish. And what about our Census Bureau and when we take the census? Well, they advise that their data on race is based on self-identification. They report that their categories are not an attempt to uh, define race biologically, anthropologically, or genetically. And they also make it clear that respondents can mark more than one race on the form to indicate their racial mixture. The categories listed under race have evolved over the past 200 years, and some of the terms that were previously used have been considered offensive and removed from the paperwork. The ways that questions are asked has also shifted. At one point, people were asked for their race and origin, but that proved to be too confusing. So, let's continue. The very idea of race is a lie. I'm going to say that again. The very idea of race is a lie. The American Society of Human Genetics, the largest professional organization, says that humans cannot be divided into biologically distinct subcategories, and it challenges the traditional concept of different races of humans as biologically separate and distinct. This is validated by many decades of research. In other words, race itself is a social construct with no biological basis. What does social construct mean? It means these are categories that man has devised. Now, I don't know about you, but that just took my breath away because I really had never thought about race being a socially constructed thing. And the more I studied it, the more I found that there were some folks who brought that about some things they did which were excellent we still use today and some which were not. But from a genetic point of view, all humans are remarkably similar. Indeed, when the Human Genome Project was completed, they found that three billion base pairs of genetic letters in humans are 99.9% .9 identical in every person. Now, I'm not a mathematician, but that's a pretty big number. And one-tenth of one percent are what they refer to as the variants, which give us our distinguishing characteristics. But for all intents and purposes, we are one human race. Now, if we believe in our Bible, what does it say about man? Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth Genesis 1 26 not different races but mankind in the image of God imago dei and when you really Stop to think about what that means. If the person you are looking at, the person you are dealing with, is created in the image of God, a word spoken ill of that individual is speaking ill of God himself. Now, out of the ground that Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens, 
and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. And the man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. Now, what was man to name? He was to name those elements of the created order. So, in the naming, that word is taxonomy. And in its broad sense, the science of classification, but more strictly, the classification of living and extinct organisms, and that means biological classification. And the term is derived from the Greek roots, taxis, arrangement, and nomos, meaning law. So it's the rules on the order of naming things. So as I thought about that and I said, Okay, naming, I remember enough from my biology classes that we got into how things are named. So let's take a look at that and how that might have influenced the idea of race. So what we're going to look at this morning is four, yes, dead guys, who influence the social construct of race. And these four men are Carolus Linnaeus, Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, Franz Joseph Gall, and Dr. Samuel Morton. Now, some of you may have heard of one or two of those folks, but perhaps many of you have never heard of any of them. I don't know. But their influence is felt even today. Their influence is felt even as recently as this past week when I received a notice from a major insurance company which asked me to identify my race. And one of the selections was Caucasian. Why would you mark Caucasian on your form? Do we know what that means and where it came from? So that's the reason I want to spend a little bit of time on our basic concept of race and how these elements have race have come into our mindset today. So, some background on Carolus Linnaeus. And I want to say a word about the Linnaean Society. This is directly from their website, and you'll note that as I go through this, I'm going to spend a little more time on Linnaeus because of his prominence uh, within our world today, but also because I believe the Linnaean Society has done a great service to all of us. You can see from their webpage, cancel culture or use it to educate. We live in a time when people are very happy to uh, put down the um, time warp hole, uh, eradicate elements of our society, which we may not want to um, consider we may not want to have around anymore. We may think are uh, outdated racist in some, uh, as they use that term. And um, they said, we're, no, we're going to talk about what Linnaeus did, why he's important, and also where he ran off the rails. So let's talk a little bit about him. He was born in 1707 uh, in Sweden. His father was a minister and also a keen gardener. And it's interesting to me that a lot of people who were theologians were also very interested in science because they believed in considering what God had made, it would reveal more of the grandeur of God. Niels taught Carl that every plant had a name, but the plant names were in Latin, they were long and descriptive, and they were very difficult to remember. And Carl dedicated himself to learning as many of these as he could, his tutor encouraged him to study medicine. And uh, in 1728, after spending a year studying medicine, he went to Uppsala University in the hope that the course would be better. And this next page, uh, you'll see I have a repeat there and I apologize for that. But um, he came to the attention of Olaf Celsius, a theologian and naturalist. And no, Olaf was not the inspiration for the character in Frozen. Um, but Celsius was, was the uncle to Anders Celsius, who was the inventor of the Celsius thermometer. And he found him studying in the University Botanic Gardens. 
And Linnaeus wrote an essay on the classification of plants and on their sexual parts, and Rudbeck was so impressed that he asked Linnaeus to become a teaching assistant in botany. And from 1732 to 1735, he traveled throughout Sweden to record and collect information on the natural resources. These inquiring minds, this young man who did all these things came to the attention of other scientists. In 1735, he went to the University of Hardwick in Holland, took his medical degree. Then he went to work for George Clifford, who I show here, who had a fantastic garden um, and, um, in Holland. And uh, so Linnaeus was in, in, in charge of this and undertook uh, all the aspects of that, and th that allowed him to publish the first of his many scientific papers. He um, returned to Sweden where he practiced medicine, became professor of botany, and by all measures he was a charismatic teacher. Teach uh, students flocked to him, the most gifted of whom he called apostles, and he sent them out on voyages of exploration to bring back uh, new plants and animals. So, those that they brought back, he would name according to his new binomial system of nomenclature. In 1747, he was appointed the chief royal physician and knighted in 1758. And then he took the name Carl von Linné, and uh, he died in the 10th of uh, January in 1778. So, so what? Let's look at his legacy. Um, he's considered the father of taxonomy. He's a pioneer in the study of ecology. He was the first to describe relationships between living things and their environments. And he's most famous for creating a system of naming plants and animals, a system that we still use today. The system is known as the binomial system, and each plant and animal is given a genus name with a specific name, a species, and both names are in Latin. And he published his Systeme Naturae in 1735 at the age of 28. And he looked at the three kingdoms of nature, the mineral, the vegetable, and the animal. But he classified over 12,000 species of plants and animals. Now I'm going to show you a very short video from the Linnaean Society. It's Dr. Isabella Charmentier. And this, remember, what Linnaeus did is before computers, before databases, before online searches. So let's hear firsthand what this remarkable man uh, did at the age of 28. <laughs> During the 1700s, the field of natural science saw an explosion in the amount of data being produced. Biologists were rapidly collecting and recording specimens from all around the world. Carl Linnaeus, who was being sent many of these specimens, had to do something to manage the incessant flow of information coming through his front door. Tables such as Systema Naturae were part of his solution. These tables allowed him to quickly and accurately process large amounts of data. Systema Naturae attempted to categorize the whole of the natural world through a series of three tables, animals, minerals, and vegetables. My name is Isabelle Charmentier. I am a historian of science, and I am also the deputy collections manager at the Linnaean Society. We live in a world that is inundated by data, and this is due to the birth of the internet and how we deal with it, but actually, that is not new. And if you take Linnaeus's letters, he was expressing the same overwhelming feeling of having to read too many books, to reply to many correspondence, to look at too many specimens. And when he was working on his catalogue of plants, he compared himself to a chicken having to lay an egg a day, in the sense that each egg was a species that he had to describe. Systema Naturae is an early example of data management technology, as it was portable, 
took up very little physical space, and was easily stored, a bit like a modern memory stick. Linnaeus used his tables as learning tools by placing similar-looking animals or plants together in the same headed row and column. Both man and primate were placed in the same row, anthropomorpha, which means man-like. They were then also placed in the same column, quadrupedia, which are animals that have hair, give birth to live young, lactate, and walk on all fours. These defined titles meant that if someone was supplied with a detailed description of an animal or plant, they could use the table to easily classify it without actually physically seeing it. Systema Naturae contained an enormous amount of information all compiled onto double-page spreads. Linnaeus's system for organising the natural world has since become the foundation for many other forms of data management. In many ways, our library reflects how we envisage our natural world. Classification of the books on the shelf will reflect the scientific classification. So, for example, all books about a particular family of plants will be kept together. Today, most of our data is stored digitally, so Systema Naturae has been replaced by online taxonomic databases. Despite these advances, the same challenges are still present today the need to manage the ever-growing volume of information about the natural world so it can be used as a tool for further scientific investigation. So that's a little bit about what he did, some pretty incredible things for his age and for his time and things that uh, still impact us today. Probably the most famous scientific name is probably the name he gave humans, Homo sapiens, which means wise or knowledgeable man. And he did two things that changed our understanding of humans. First of all, he decided that man was an animal like any other, and he put Homo sapiens in the animal kingdom alongside other animals which paved the way for Darwin's theory of evolution a century later. And because he considered man as simply another animal, he subdivided humans into four different varieties based on skin color and geographic origin. White for Europeans, red for Americans, tawny for Asians, and black for Africans. And he initially believed that these varieties arose from different climatic conditions. And in the 12th edition of Sisseme Naturae, he proposed more hierarchical views based on differences in innate moral and intellectual capabilities, thus contributing to the birth of scientific racism. So he had a great start, but then he went off the rails. So let's take a look at uh, this aspect of scientific racism. His work on the classification of man forms one of the 18th century roots of modern racism. And few studies have looked into the depth of the writings of Linnaeus to go beyond uh, his main work on the subject, which was the 10th edition of his Systema Naturae. And Dr. Stefan Mueller-Willa has in the past years said, we really need to study that more. What caused him uh, to do this? He was the first naturalist to include man within the animal kingdom. Now remember what scripture said, and I ask you is, through all of this, just be thinking of what scripture talks, teaches us. And in 1735, the class into which Linnaeus inserted man was called quadrupeds in the order Anthropomorpha, and these names Linnaeus would change to mammals and primates later in his career. You saw in the video, this is uh, uh, not a, a very clear image, and you can see how small the writing is, but just the, the Systema Naturae and the system that he used. And then I want to go on and take a look at um, a, a section of it, and I put two arrows there. Um, one is no se te ipsum. Remember that Fs, some Fs are like, you read like Ss in, uh, in Old English. And uh, the one on the right there, you can see the, the four different uh, categories. 
and they're arranged in a hierarchical order. Um, he distinguished humans from other animals um, by the ability to know thyself, and this would uh, lead Linnaeus to attribute the specific uh, epithet sapiens to the genus Homo, uh, where he began to use his binomial nomenclature. And there was some pushback. Um, advance the next slide, if you would, there. Uh, the Dutch naturalist Renovius said, I disagree with your decision to include humans under quadrupeds, for although man ranks first among the animals, he should in fact be considered to excel all other living beings which were created by God to man's delight and benefit. And as I said, he edited it 12 times um, in his life. And uh, for the first nine editions, it was just uh, the classification of man remained stable. And then after that, things started to go downhill. Um, the, I wanted to take these four uh, groupings here. Europeus albus, European white, Americanus rubicens reddish, American reddish, remember this is the American Indian or Native American. Asiaticus fuscus, the Asian tawny, and the Africanus niger, or the African black. And yes, that is the origin of the despicable epithet that is used, unfortunately. And the word that Linnaeus uses to denote the taxon between the species and varieties of man, uh, literally, man varies. As far as we know, Linnaeus never used the word race in reference to humans or any other organisms. Um, but he did write, God created one human as the Holy Scripture teaches, but if the slightest trait or difference was sufficient, there would easily stick out thousands of different species of man. They display namely white, red, black, and gray hair, white, rosy, tawny, and black faces, straight, stubby, crooked, flattened, and aquiline noses. Among them we find giants and pygmies, fat and skinny people, erect, humpy, brittle, and lame people, etc., etc. But who with a sane mind would be so frivolous as to call these distinct species? And why did he even come up with these four categories? Well, um, the four varieties of man corresponded to the then known four continents of the world, Europe, America, Asia, and Africa. And he would, he would do more than that. The division, according to the four corners of the world, come back in a variety of ways. Coffee, tea, beer, and chocolate also represented the four continents, for instance. Uh, slide 43, please. Uh, this emphasis on geography has been stressed by recent scholars. Linnaeus did not present human races as distinct types. In fact, he shared contemporary views that skin color, the chief criterion of distinction employed in his Systema Naturae was largely a product of climate and hence as variable as other accidental bodily characteristics of stature or weight. And sometime in the 1750s, Linnaeus started revising his classification of humans to add physical and moral attributes to geography and skin color. And as Dr. Uh, Miller White has said, studies should be undertaken to understand why he took the step of deepening this classification of humans in ways that have such unfortunate, long-lasting consequences. So, to the four continents and four varieties of humans, Linnaeus added the four temperaments. And you all probably remember this from your psychology classes or others. Uh, according to medieval medical doctrine, the four humors were thought to be sanguine or blood, choleric, yellow bile, melancholic, black bile, and phlegmatic or phlegm. And if you remember, sanguine means optimistic or positive, choleric means bad tempered or irritable. Melancholic means pensive sadness, and phlegmatic means calm, 
disposition or on emotional. By adding these and other moral attributes, he departed from the purely geographic and environmental factors. So the four varieties became six, six and as I said, he added body posture, physical traits relating to hair color and form, eye color, distinctive facial traits, behavior, manner of clothing, and the form of government. So what did that end up meaning? So on our next slide, you'll see, hopefully you can see, but uh, I will just share with you that he again arranges them. He puts Americanus first, Europeus second, Asiaticus third, and Africanus fourth. But you'll see he begins to describe moral characteristics to them. So for the, the uh, Europeus, light, wise, inventor, the Asiatic, stern, haughty, greedy, Africanicus, black, phlegmatic, lazy, sly, sluggish, neglectful, and governed by choice or caprice. And <clears throat> so the 1735 classification of man started with Europeus, then went on with Americanus, Asiaticus, and ended with Africanus. And notes by his son shows that Linnaeus started this lecture in the 1750s with Asiaticus. So he changed that order, began to think about new things. Now, mind you, this was one of the brightest scientific minds of his age. So he began in a good way. He did things which we're still using today, but then he began to ascribe moral attributes, physical characteristics, social characteristics, and so forth to people because of the color of their skin. And this is where it went off the rails. And um, by the 10th edition, uh, his description of Africanus was the longest, the most detailed and physical, and also the most negative. So you can see how this began to inform the way people thought. And I would just remind all of us that science is a good thing, uh, science is something that we should investigate fully and be involved in, but science is not God. And uh, again, it comes back to the scriptural principles which we've all been taught, and you can see how when you begin to vary from that, that things man-centered, man-derived, begin to uh, break down pretty quickly. So. The Enlightenment thinkers inherited a very hierarchical view of the natural world from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance, a great chain of beings arranged in a series of gradients or steps with God at the very top, man underneath and down through the animals and vegetables to inorganic materials at the bottom. But Linnaeus's taxonomic work partly upset this linear hierarchy of more or less perfect natural beings. The alignment of races with four continents put them all on the same level as natural varieties, but the idea of a graded scale of nature also survived in the linear arrangement of human varieties. So his hierarchy with black people at the very bottom, associated with negative moral and physical attributes, stuck. And what's remained influential was his classification system, uh, but it went on to entrench the view that Linnaeus's varieties were really subspecies. So, I'm just focused here on this slide on it highlights how ambivalent and very tentative ideas in science can, can become entrenched with time due to developments in wider culture. So I've taken more time with Linnaeus because of the prominence of his work uh, even in our systems today. But now I want to look at uh, this man, Johann Friedrich Blumenbach. He was a physician, a naturalist, a physiologist, and an anthropologist. He's considered to be the main founder of zoology and anthropology as comparative scientific disciplines. He was also a race theorist. So here you have, again, a man very well learned, uh, an expert in many different areas, but then gets into an area which um, you really shouldn't have, obviously. He held to the degenerative 
hypothesis of racial origins. And he claimed that Adam and Eve were Caucasian inhabitants of Asia and that other races came about by degeneration from environmental factors su such as the sun and poor diet. So where is Caucasus? Why are they called Caucasian? And this I found absolutely fascinating. The true Caucasians came from areas around the Caucasus Mountains, which run from the Black Sea to the Caspian Sea. And that includes present-day Armenia, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Russia. So what is the Caucasus ethnicity? Well, they don't have one ethnicity. Rather, they're a group of almost 150 ethnicities living in the regions around the Caucasus Mountains. And Caucasians were, as Blumenbach presented them, the white race and included people not only from the Caucasus region, but also from Europe, northern India, and parts of Africa. So why did he name the white race Caucasian? Studying a female skull from the region, he was struck by its symmetry and fine features, describing it as handsome and becoming. And if the white race was the most beautiful, and this was the most beautiful skull, then its place of origin, the Caucasus Mountains, must be the birthplace of the white race, hence the term Caucasians. Well, there are some redeeming things about Blumenbach. He believed in the unity of humankind, arguing that individual members of all groups had the equal capacity for intelligence, creativity, and organization. In fact, he was mocked by his fellow scientists for his generous views of the equality regarding non-white groups. And he correctly hypothesized that humans of all races descended from a common ancestor, monogeny, rather than from multiple origins or polygyny, a key debate of his time. And again, I would go back to what does the Bible say? This next slide is one I received from a major insurance company just in the past week. It says, which one of the following races or, and or ethnicities do you identify? And there you see the word Caucasian. So how did I respond? You'll see it there in the red. Uh, and I would suggest that all of us really should do that. That's the truth. We are all part of the human race. So, let's move on to Franz Joseph Gull. Again, a well, well-trained scientist. He was a neuroanatomist, a physiologist, and pioneer in the study of the localization of mental functions in the brain. And he's claimed as the founder of the pseudoscience of phrenology. And it's interesting to me that phrenology has actually come back of late. Um, it's based on the surface of a person's skull, and he would make assumptions about that person's fundamental faculties and their character. In his advanced studies in medicine, he made observations about his classmates, and he noticed that many of the particularly bright students had prominent eyeballs and concluded that this could not be purely coincidental. He believed there were 20 mental, 27 fundamental faculties. Among them were a recollection of people, mechanical ability, talent for poetry, love of property, and even a murder instinct. So imagine by examining people's skulls that you would come up with uh, a thought such as this. The US in the 1930s and the 1840s, when phrenology became popular, struggled to justify the continuation of slavery in the face of a growing abolition movement. And they were also dealing with interactions between the white Western settlers and the existing Native American populations. And in the case of slavery, physicians Charles Caldwell used phrenology to attempt to prove that African people were in their rightful place as slaves. How popular was it? Usually you can tell the focus of things of the day 
by what is cartoon. And here is a cartoon, and you can see that the, this phrenologist is examining this woman's head, and you can see the deformities of the skulls of those who are in line to be uh, examined next. Um, so that's a little bit about phrenology and how that came into the whole aspect of, uh, of race. And the last person that we're going to look at is Dr. Samuel George Morton who's the father of craniometry, the first school of American anthropology, and he himself was the most highly regarded American scientist of the early and middle 19th century. So what did he do? Well, he wrote this book, Craniana Americana, in 1839. And 19th century Americans were very much interested in physical anthropology and they were interested in theories that connected the way people looked to their basic character, their intelligence, their moral sense, their capacities for leadership or violence. And Morton believed that cranial capacity, the size of the skull, gave an accurate measurement of intelligence. So, the bigger your brain, the smarter you were. And Morton collected thousands of skulls and measured their cranial capacity. He had 78 illustrations within his book. And this is a study that's uh, being undertaken now by Dr. James Poskett at Cambridge University. And within a few years of his publication of his book, it had been read in Britain, France, Germany, Russia, and India. And he's, Dr. Poskett's trying to find out how did this become so influential? not only in the United States, but in Europe and beyond. He says this research is crucial for understanding how, particularly in the early 19th century, European scholars tended to treat American society with suspicion, but Morton had to work hard to convince his peers across the Atlantic." Unquote. Only 50 copies of this book were printed, but despite its limited, limits to access, his ideas and images penetrated beyond the scientific elite with working class readers. A full page notice of the work appeared in Chambers Edinburgh Journal in 1840, a uh, publication with a circulation of at least 60,000 at the time. And copies of Morton's illustration were also reproduced in cheap formats. In 1840, the Ladies' Repository, a magazine for Methodist women in Ohio, quoted Morton in an article entitled, Man, the author described Native Americans as averse to cultivation and slow in inquiring knowledge. For white settlers living in the West, this was exactly what they wanted to hear. Crania Americana was published just as the remaining Shawnee peoples of Ohio were forcibly relocated west of the Mississippi River. So what did he write about? Europeans, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail here, but uh, people the finest portions of the earth and given birth to its fairest inhabitants. The Asians, ingenious, imitative, highly susceptible of cultivation, that is learning. Native Americans are not only averse to the restraints of education, but for the most part are incapable of a continued process of reasoning on abstract subjects. And last for the Africans. In disposition, the Negro is joyous, flexible, and indolent, fond of warlike enterprises. But once overcome, they yield to their destiny and accommodate themselves with amazing faculty, facility to every change of circumstance. Negroes have little invention, but strong powers of imitation, so that they readily acquire mechanic arts. They have a great talent for music, and all their external senses are remarkably acute. So it's no wonder then that the Charleston Medical Journal noted in Morton's death that we of the South should consider him as our benefactor for aiding most materially in giving to the Negro his true position as an inferior race. 
In this next slide, you'll see the pictures of the skulls which uh, he had used, the, the crania, and uh, again, through this examination, using what they deem scientific processes and principles, but coming up with all of these other attributes. And these skulls are, uh, have been at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, which is where Dr. Morton taught. And uh, as you can imagine now, they're in the process of repatriating the skulls to the families of those from whom they were taken, and uh, also a system of burying the skulls. I must tell you, I, I don't take a great deal of pleasure in presenting this today, but for me, this whole aspect of race, we really need to go and see the influences that have uh, burrowed in uh, to our culture, in some cases our thinking. Uh, I know that for many, this whole idea of race is, is front and center, but um, I must agree with Rosa Parks. I believe there is only one race human race. And also, Muhammad Ali, who wrote, hating people because of their color is wrong, and it doesn't matter which color does the hating. It's just plain wrong. I would hope that this overview today would send you to what does the Bible say about race? And uh, I think you'll find it absolutely fascinating. And as I read the, the words from Revelation, um, what will take place in the final days. But maybe we can all begin at Acts 17, 26. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. There's a pastor over in Fairfax, it's a large church, Emmanuel Bible Church, Jesse Johnson, who wrote, there really is no biological basis for the concept of race. It goes against logic, science, history, and most importantly, the Bible. It is a fiction invented to deprive others of rights and to justify sinful abuses of mankind. I call this a Christian distinctive one race, that is. But in God's providence, there are now also secular scientists that are saying the same thing. And as we looked at the Genome Project, that indeed is what science is saying. So when we gather together again next, the pastor will be back talking more about critical race theory. And then in my next session, I'll be talking about uh, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. And then in the final session, we'll be talking about the critical school or the Frankfurt School, uh, critical theory, critical race theory, and some of the other things that that has uh, spawned. So I pray that uh, today hasn't been too ponderous. Um, I'm afraid it probably was, but uh, I'm encouraged by the fact that we can come and have a discussion of this. Uh, that we can, as a body, come together to understand what Scripture teaches uh, about who we are, how God has made us, and how we're to interact uh, with one another. So I thank you for your kind attention today. And as I say, there are uh, handouts available if you want them, and also a bibliography. Uh, but as you begin your study of Scripture, I'm going to end with just... Uh, what uh, an article by Dr. Daniel Hayes uh, writes, who's a professor of biblical studies. The biblical world was multi-ethnic and numerous different ethnic groups, including black Africans, were involved in God's unfolding plan of redemption. All people are created in the image of God and therefore all races and ethnic groups have the same equal status and equal unique value. Inter-ethnic marriages are sanctioned in Scripture when they are within the faith. The Gospel demands that we carry compassion and the message of Christ across ethnic lines. The New Testament teaches that as Christians, we are all unified together in Christ, regardless of our differing ethnicities. 
Furthermore, our primary concept of self-identity should not be by our ethnicity, but our membership as part of the body and family of Christ. And the picture of God's people at the climax of history depicts an, a multi-ethnic congregation from every tribe, language, people, and nation, all gathered together in worship around God's throne. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for Belcroft Bible Church. We thank you for each family that's represented here. We pray that we might um, pay heed to the, uh, the great commandments, the second of which is that we should love our neighbor as ourself. And Lord, we know that's a very, very tall order, and we know that we fail miserably at that day in and day out. But Lord, we just pray that you would give us the strength and conviction and the will uh, by your grace to love others, um, to not be looking at outward appearances, uh, just as you have said, I don't look at the outward appearance, but I look at the, the heart of a man. And so, Lord, we just pray that we might uh, do that in all our dealings with those with whom we come into contact. We just pray in thanksgiving for this day and pray that you would give safety to those here assembled and may we join together again this evening as we celebrate your gracious provision to us as we are involved in your church. All these things we ask in our most precious name. Amen. Thank you all for being here today. Appreciate it.